been just about 18 years since Pirates of the Caribbean Curse of the Black Pearls released. That movie, which is legitimately great, as you've no doubt heard, is based off the ride at Disney World and has no business being any good. But guess what? When you're sincere and earnest in your plotting, hilarious in your dialogue and action, and intricate and extravagant in your world building, it's a recipe for success. Director Gore Verbinski and writers Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio created this wonderful sandbox full of whimsy, fun, and a number of different themes and made a masterful trilogy with Dead Man's Chest and At World's End. And if anyone wants to disagree with me on that point, we shall go to war! Now some people just don't like big action blockbusters, and I get that. Not every movie is for every person, and that's fine. But I've seen lots of people over the last 14 years or so since the release of At World's End dismiss the Pirates franchise out of hand, and I'm not sure this is totally fair. Yes, its overall quality and reputation has been hampered a good deal by two more lackluster sequels, but I'm of the opinion that these movies should never have been made in the first place. And if they were going to make a Pirates 4 and 5, it should have been a continuation of the previous story. Or at least, they should have taken what worked from the first three and built on that. Because what made Pirates 1 through 3 so good was that Will, Elizabeth, and Jack all shared the spotlight. The percentages of who got how much attention might have skewered towards Jack as the series went on, but Will and Elizabeth were always the heart of the story, with Jack having much of the moral thematic work done around him. But I'm not here to dump on Pirates 4 and 5, because that's been done plenty, and I don't like being negative when I could be positive. And boy, can I be positive when it comes to Pirates 1 through 3. There's a prevailing notion that the Pirates franchise just isn't popular or good. But if you look at the box office numbers, Curse of the Black Pearl made $654 million worldwide against a $140 million budget, which caused Disney to greenlight a sequel to a movie that was meant to be a standalone. Dead Man's Chest was the highest grossing movie of the year it was released, and the third highest of the 2000s, and was the third ever movie to reach the $1 billion mark. Meanwhile, At World's End nearly reached that billion dollar mark, and was the highest grossing movie of 2007. I don't know if it's because these movies are meant for kids, or because the bad guy is a giant fish man with a tentacle beard, a peg leg, and a claw for a hand, but people tend to think that it's some sort of problem that there was only ever one Master and Commander and five Pirates movies. Just search it on Twitter, and here's what you'll find. You can't blame pirates that these movies came out too close to each other. All this is to say, there seems to be at least some amount of resentment towards the success of the Pirates movies. Whereas Master and Commander won two Oscars and was nominated for eight more, including Best Picture, the Pirates movies, even though they were recognized for their visual effects, they mostly spent their time garnering box office accolades. To me, it seems like the Pirates movies are lumped in with franchises like Fast and Furious or Transformers. In fact, if you look here at the highest grossing franchises of all time, that comparison isn't actually too far off. The difference is, Fast and the Transformers each had a successful first movie and continued to build off it one movie at a time. But after the successful first Pirates movie, Disney greenlit two sequels which were to be filmed back to back, and which allowed them to tell a more connected story with one large arc, instead of a more episodic type that was contingent on the success of its predecessor. Verbinski knew exactly what he wanted to do with the first Pirates movie, and then even with the massive time constraints placed on the second two, he had enough of a visionary and creative mind to make something out of nothing. There are stories of him and the writers almost literally throwing stuff at the wall to see what would stick. They remember the little things they threw into the first movie like, And then they made me their chief. And, Clearly you've never been to Singapore. And all the mentions of Bootstrap Bill, He strapped a cannon to Bootstraps, Bootstraps. And were able to form a tight sequel and a sprawling one that still ship loads of fun to watch. They even threw in little extra details like the sword that stabs Will, being the one he made in the first movie. But what's so surprising and refreshing about this original trilogy is that they feel fresh, and they're not soulless like a lot of other studio sequels like this are. Yes, they were making the movies to meet a deadline, but they still feel like a specific vision. Verbinski has talked about how they knew they needed to wrap up specific storylines in the writer's room. The focus all the way through was on story as opposed to being on moments in action. These moments came naturally as a result of the story. It's why when you're watching this scene here, it's visually creative and fun but that's not the only thing going for it. Each one of the characters, Jack, Will, and Norrington, have a specific reason for going after the chest and fighting their opponents. As Rigetti eloquently puts it, Each wants the chest for himself, don't he? Mr. Norrington, I think, is trying to regain a bit of honor. Old Jack's looking to trade it, save his own skin. And Turner there, I think he's trying to settle some unresolved business twixt him and his twice-cursed pirate father. And it's not like it's only been lip service paid to these ideas. Almost two whole movies have been building up to these character motivations, up to this point to get to where they are. But this is just one example of a larger trend throughout these three movies. Verbinski, Elliot, and Rossio may not have known exactly how they wanted the story to go from the beginning, but it's clear that they were excellent collaborators. Even though the third movie is the tiniest bit bloated, 
it still narratively, thematically, and tonally fits with the first two films. They knew exactly what they wanted this franchise to be, never attempted to overstep their limits. It's really a feat to be able to keep a franchise like this grounded the way they did. Amid Jack being roasted by cannibals, fish people playing dice, undead pirates, the Brethren Court, the fish pirate leader's heart being in a chest which forces him to team up with the British Navy, amidst all of that, it's still a human story at its core. Even for as great as Captain Jack is, Will and Elizabeth are really the series' core. There's of course their love story, but then they each have relationships with their fathers, which brings up interesting thematic work. It allows for ideas to be explored, like the constraints of high society versus the freedom that being a pirate affords. As well, Davy Jones, the aforementioned fish pirate leader, isn't just a mindless cool looking villain. His whole motivation comes from his heartbreaking past and his relationship with Calypso. Barbosa's motivation, at least in the first movie, is about wanting to just feel something again and be human. And of course, there's the complex nature of Jack, who is a pirate, but also goes through an entire arc that culminates in a final selfless moment. With all the swashbuckling and humor and overall bombastic nature of these movies, not a lot of time is devoted to dissecting their themes, of which there are plenty. Questionable morality permeates the entire trilogy, and are presented with questions about what we're willing to give up in order to achieve an end. For example, Will isn't completely a pirate, but he's also not completely a law-abiding British citizen. He starts out in the strict, classist society, wanting to get out by way of constantly practicing his swordplay. But when he's whisked away on an adventure by Jack, he has his mind open to the larger world of pirates. He becomes a pirate and exerts the freedom that he's been wanting to for so long. But he finds out the so-called freedom of piracy comes with its own shackles. His father is aboard the Flying Dutchman for life, and Davy Jones is banished to the sea where he's separated from his true love. Will's true love is Elizabeth, and he can't be with her by devoting his life to piracy. So there are shackles to both society and anarchy. But by the end, he becomes what Davy Jones couldn't be a generous captain of the Dutchman who still has the everlasting commitment of the love of his life. Speaking of, Elizabeth also breaks her way out of the structures of upper-class England and becomes a pirate who makes her own choices. She starts off as a damsel in distress type, but by the end of the first movie, she makes her choice to stand with Will and Jack. She fights her way out of captivity at the beginning of Dead Man's Chest and proceeds to become more and more like a pirate before finally being the reason everyone, well, except Jack of course, is able to escape the Kraken at the end. And then by Atworld's end, she's Pirate King, and exerting her ability to choose by living on some island with her child. I like the visual metaphor of her being put in the tight corset in Curse of the Black Pearl, before finally having broken free of what's holding her back and wearing the loose-fitting pirate's garb in the post credit scene of Atworld's end. There are also themes of modernization, the world shrinking, capitalism, and the lack of freedom, and immortality, all through the lens of Jack. Beckett says, Jack Sparrow is a dying breed. Which means there's no longer going to be that chance for freedom that piracy aspires to due to the rapid expansion of the map. The East India Trading Company is a capitalistic company that just wants to control the seas, which cuts off the chance for freedom outside their own rules. There's even the great little scene next to the dead kraken where Jack says, The world's still the same. It's just less in it. Also, Jack's father, when speaking about living forever, says, It's not just about living forever, Jackie. The trick is living with yourself forever. These movies are not lacking in ideas to chew on. Another one of my favorite aspects of the Pirates movies is the world building. In Curse of the Black Pearl, we get undead pirates and mentions of the pirate code. Much like the first Star Wars movie, it doesn't really challenge you much in terms of its world building. It introduces you to the characters and it hints at a much larger world. But by the time 2 and 3 come around, the filmmakers are allowed to run free. We learn about a being who's able to control the seas, an evil pirate with his heart in a chest, the massive brethren court, Davy Jones's locker, and pirate lords. Actual care went into building the world that these movies inhabit. The movies are able to get away with all of this because they take themselves very seriously. Yes, they're silly, slapstick, over the top, and funny, but they're unapologetically so. They aren't afraid to be exactly what they are, as opposed to something like the MCU, where everything seems tongue-in-cheek and aware of the overall silliness. Language! No one else is going to deal with the fact that Cap just said, language? It never tried to reach beyond its limits, but it didn't let these limits constrain it. Elizabeth is a pirate king. Davy Jones, the big bad scary guy that sucks people's faces off, stands in a freaking bucket during an epic beach showdown during which a wild guitar riff plays. The main character has a starfish on his face and it's taken completely seriously. One of the main characters is able to survive because they cut his heart out and put it in a treasure chest. They sail to purgatory and then escape it by flipping a ship. There's a hallucination of Jack captaining his ship in the sand and he's imagining a crew of just himself. There's these crab rock guys. This shot right here. Ah! Ah! 
there's typical fantasy stuff like the skeleton pirates and usual sight gags like Rigetti's eye, but the rest of it is just going for it for the sake of going for it. And I'm just like, yeah. It's all coming from a sincere place by Verbinski and the rest of the cast and crew. There's no winking at the camera. It's all full of sincerity and genuine love for the craft. These three movies do all of this filmmaking and storytelling stuff so well, and then give you the icing on the cake by having the CGI look like it was done today. It goes to show the benefit of practical locations and actual sunlight lighting your actors. Davy Jones looks incredible, even today, and he can rival Thanos or Steppenwolf or any other fully CGI character like this. And pair the stunning visuals with a now iconic score, and you've got something truly special. In short, Curse of the Black Pearl, Dead Man's Chest, and At World's End work so well because of their connectedness and the continuity in front of and behind the camera. It's a massive world that isn't cynically made. Verbinski signed onto these movies, and as an up-and-comer at the time, he didn't do them just for a paycheck, and he didn't let the scale daunt him. He tells a tight, if slightly bloated, pre-movie story about love, freedom, and morality. Of course, 4 and 5 were cynically made, and unless Verbinski, Elliot, and Rossio pull something out of nowhere, any future installments will be cynically made as well. 4 and 5 feel off because they go back to the Pirates world just for the sake of going back. They're completely forgettable and don't offer any real reason to pay attention. It's them finally starting to feel like Transformers, just making more because they make money. They're totally overstaying their welcome. People love to say there's no Pirates of the Caribbean without Jack Sparrow, and I think that's true, but only to a certain extent. In reality, I think the real fact is there's no Pirates of the Caribbean without Will and Elizabeth. I'm not trying to minimize Jack's quality as a character, but he's better when he's not the focus of the story. He is what audiences clung to after the first movie, so it was inevitable that his role would be increased. But the heart of the movies is still Will and Elizabeth. You're more invested in their relationship with each other and those around them than you are to Jack. Their relationship is much more human, while Jack's the one who delivers a larger commentary on freedom and society. So when you get to the fourth and fifth Pirates movies, with Will Elizabeth out of the picture, there's nothing to really grab onto. I was never as interested in the pirates having a one-off adventure in each movie as I was seeing this sprawling narrative evolve. Elliot and Rossio wrote the screenplay for On Stranger Tides, which does deliver on the stinger from At World's End, so Jack still feels like Jack for the most part, but by Dead Man Tell No Tales, Rossio has a story credit, but that's it. In this one, Jack is completely unclever and is literally a bumbling drunk fool. Early on, he obviously had more than an affinity for rum. Why's rum gone? But he was witty, clever, quick on his feet, and didn't literally slur his words. Well, it's your lucky day. Have either of the four of you seen my bank? And the return of the Pirates franchise coincided with Disney coming out with Alice in Wonderland and the rest of the remakes. It's a pretty clear point of where the company just decided to go back to what's worked in the past, and making them soulless caricatures of themselves instead of making new stuff and leaving the old stuff that worked alone. These last two movies have just become noise. The action and shenanigans aren't motivated anymore. They're just happening on screen. This scene of Jack escaping from the king in Stranger Tides, or this guillotine scene would be cool if they'd been done by Verbinski, but instead, it's just stuff that's happening on the screen. It's a sad way to see how the franchise has devolved. The worst thing I could say about them is that as I rewatched all five movies for this video, I was pumped up about the franchise after the first three, and then rapidly got bored and tired of Pirates about halfway through the fourth. It's easy and popular to say that Pirates of the Caribbean died and the well was already dry after the first movie. But I don't think that's the case at all. Its first three installments, thanks to Gore Verbinski and his writing team, are completely earnest and sincere, and they're a ton of fun to watch and feature plenty to chew on along the way. I hope those three movies are able to stand the test of time. Of course to some, their legacy is tainted because of controversy surrounding their star, and the future of the franchise is uncertain. But between the action, the heart, the humor, the themes, and the story, there is so much to admire about the original Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know in the comments what you think about Pirates of the Caribbean, or about another franchise that you think is better than its reputation. If you liked the video and you want to see more like it, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. There will be a new video every other Thursday.